Welcome to the Faith Dialogue Podcast with your host, Pastor Ken Baer. Are you ready to swim in the deep end of the Bible pool or climb to the top of Faith Mountain? If so, open the eyes that see, those ears that hear, and a heart that is receptive. Get your cup of coffee and your Bible as we begin. Every time we get together like this, we give you the praise because we meet and you meet with us. And that's just a real blessing to us. We thank you, Lord, for your word that gives us so much encouragement and instructions um, uh, while we're here uh, waiting for your second coming. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So in front of you on your piece of paper, uh, we are in parable number 19. There's actually 46, 47, depending on how you count. Um, parables in the Bible, uh, and we're going to go all the way through them, so we're not, not quite halfway through, uh, but we're just going to keep on going through them. But this parable is actually two slightly different parables. Uh, they're both called the parable of the lost sheep, but you'll see, I've, I've printed them both because they, they have, um, there's, a, there's a little bit of a difference in them, and as a result, we'll, we'll teach on them again in another five or six weeks. But because uh, one's in Luke and one's in Matthew, uh, but let me let me read it for you, and we'll kind of go from there. See that you do not look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices more over that one sheep than over the 99 that did not stray. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Now, I also included um, the, uh, the one from, uh, from Matthew as well. And, and the reason I do that is because both of these, both of these are very similar, but there's a little key differences. So, Here's the one in Matthew. It says, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to listen to Jesus. So the Pharisees and scribes began to grumble. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the pasture and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, comes home, calls together his friends and neighbors to tell them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you that there are, will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous ones who do not need to repent. Which is, they're in yeah, this... Tell me again, I didn't hear it. Well, in this, in this gospel, in, the, in this parable, we talk about the lost sheep. And what Ashley said is that reminded her of the lost son, the, the, the prodigal son that goes away. Because oh, yeah. when he comes back, there's this rejoicing. There's this feast that's going on. And you're exactly right. In the Gospel of Luke, there are, there are three parables. And it's the parable of the lost sheep, and then the parable of the coin, and then the parable of the prodigal son. So you could look at it this way. You have lost sheep, lost coin, lost son, okay? And it's not coincidental that these three parables are put together. Now remember the fact that we've got two parables here, one in Luke and one in Matthew, that are similar but somewhat different tells us a number of things. One of the things that it tells us is that Jesus, it says that Jesus often spoke in parables. In fact, in one place it says, without a parable, Jesus did not speak, did not speak, did not open his mouth without speaking in a parable. And that's, of course, that's, that's hyperbole, but, but what they're saying is that he spoke a lot in parables. Well, if he spoke a lot in parables and he's traveling around, and basically in the Gospels we have a three-year record of his travels, it's not unusual that he's going to tell the same story, just as I do. If you've been around me long enough, you'll know that sometimes I just tell the same story again. But every time I tell it, there's probably some little difference, little difference. And as you can see the same thing here. Jesus, in the first one, um, He's, 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 um, he's talking to the Pharisees, um, but, but he's, he's mentioning children in the first one. So verse 10 says, See that you do not look down on any of these little ones, meaning children. For I tell you that there are angels in heaven to always see the face of my Father. In the beginning of the second one in Matthew, that the uh, tax collectors and the, and the um, sinners 
were gathered around Jesus. Remember, Jesus had this ability to attract people that were outside of his social class, right? Outside of, these weren't the holy rollers. These were the, the common people. And Jesus attracted them to him. Of course, the Pharisees and the Sadducees would look down on him for that because he's associating, you know, you're guilty by association. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So both of these parables are given in response to different situations. And then also, notice at the end, um, in, verse, in, in, uh, in Luke, it says, In the same way, I tell you, the Father in heaven is not willing that any of these should, little ones should perish. But the end of the, of, of the parable of the lost sheep in, in the Gospel of Matthew tells us about, that, about this rejoicing in heaven that Ashley picked up on, which is there's this rejoicing in heaven, which is exactly what you can imagine God does when there's a sinner that repents. So again, what these, what these parables tell us is a couple of things. One is that there's an accurate transmission of the words of Jesus to the contemporary language. We actually have the words of Jesus. We actually have the words. They've been faithfully recorded. The fact that there's a little bit of difference, a variation, actually improves the reliability of the scriptures. And the reason I say that is, is if you if you watch uh, crime TV, if you watch the, the the shows where there's trials going on, one of the shows we love watching on uh, is, is Bull. Do you guys ever watch Bull? Bull's a show about about a uh, he, he's about a, a psychologist that actually works with juries. And what he tries to do is he tries to figure out to put, how to put the right juries on the trial so that he advances the the outcome of what his client wants. Is it really? Dr. Phil. I didn't know that. But it's a, it's a great show. It's a lot of fun. He's a what? Dr. Phil. He He's a psychologist. Oh, really? And help, really? and help juries. Right. Oh, okay. It's based on his journey or like, you know, similarities yeah. of his. That's interesting. That's interesting. I didn't know that. So, but if you notice in the juries, what you'll find, if, if, if you take testimony, if, if there was a crime that committed and we interviewed three people and they gave exactly the same story, mentioning the same details, you'd say, this was rehearsed. I have, I have less confidence that what these three people are telling me because it is so close. It's actually been copied. Somebody wrote it and copied it so people are reading off of the same sheet. However, if you have three eyewitness accounts and they differ, even to the fact that says somebody says the man had brown hair and the other one says the man had blonde hair. He was tall. No, he was fat. Or he used a gun. No, he used a knife. People, experts will tell you that that's actually very reliable testimony because even though some of the details are somewhat different, the main story is true. The main story is true. So when we see, when we see things in the scriptures that are, are slightly different, it gives us a, a, a clue of a couple things. One, you're probably talking about two different instances or two different viewpoints. And when you have two different viewpoints, you're going to see things a little bit different. The same way with these parables. If you listen to me, if you come to my classes and we go through the parables, you'll hear me talk about this is the meaning of the parable. Well, who am I? I'm just a teacher. I'm just a teacher. Do I have it wrong? Sometimes. Sometimes I get it wrong. So sometimes you go to your church or you'll hear somebody else on the radio or you'll listen to somebody and they'll tell you a slightly different point of the parable. And that's okay. That's good. The main focus is always the same. And what's the main focus of this? I mean, we can get to the heart of this. God loves the lost. He loves the lost. And not only does he love the lost, but he's willing to do whatever it takes to go and find you and keep you and bring you back into the fold. Remember, Jesus said that he was the, the good shepherd. The good shepherd will lie his, lay his life down for the sheep. The hiring's not like that. The person that's just hired to do a job, he's going to run away. He's going to run away. But the, but the good shepherds will always go after the sheep. So it reminds me of a story. You guys always like my stories, right? So I tell you stories about things I do. <laughs> Ashley was asking about, about uh, my career at Ford. And at, at Ford, I had a number of different jobs. I worked there for 23 years and ended up becoming pretty senior in the organization. Now, you always have boss. You always have lots of bosses. But I got to be pretty senior, and we ended up in Mexico. And if, you, if you're in Mexico, Mexico is a great country, wonderful country. 
lots of wonderful people and great culture and great food and lots of diversity. People don't realize the diversity, but there's a there's a huge Chinese group of people in 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 uh, in, uh, in Mexico. Our our landlords were Italian. Um, there's a lot of different different ethnic groups. My my daughter-in-law, even though she's a Mexican, full-blown Mexican, she's born in Mexico. Her mother and father are both Mexicans, but her background, just like us, is Lebanese. Her family is from Lebanon. That's where the family immigrated from. They came from Lebanon and they landed in Mexico. So she's, she has this nationality. So anyway, I say this because we got to the point that we ended up in Mexico. It was one of my final journeys at Ford Motor Company. I was pretty senior. And because I was senior, we were a little concerned about, about kidnapping. So we had to be a little careful about how we got around and they gave us some lessons and different things. And, and uh, my, my children and my wife typically had uh, a driver that was also a bodyguard with them. And it sounds strange when you think about it that you have a bodyguard. But if you live in Mexico and, and you have a, a pretty substantial job, um, having a bodyguard is not a, is a pretty good idea. So anyway, I say this because my daughter was around 17 years old, 17, 18 years old, just enjoying it, just loving Mexico. And uh, she was, she was, in fact, she graduated from high school in Mexico. And it was her senior year, and they were going out to a big party, like a prom, big party. They were all dressed up. And we knew her boyfriend, and we knew some of her other friends. And, uh, and the guys had come to pick up the, the gals, and they came to our house with their drivers. Because these were all pretty wealthy Mexicans as well. And wealthy Mexicans driving nice cars, they also have drivers, and they have bodyguards. So my daughter is getting ready to go, and I'm all excited that she's going on and having a good time. And of course, as a concerned father, you always say, now be careful, you know, yeah. be careful, you know, make sure that you come back, be careful who you associate with and stuff like that. Just want you to come back safe. I want you to have a good time, but I want you to come back safely. And she said, oh, dad, she says, you know, these, these boys, they have, they have bodyguards. They have bodyguards, so I'm going to be fine. And I turned to her and I said, you have to understand, <laughs> these bodyguards are protecting the boys, okay? Yeah. You, they'll use as a human shield if they have to, you know? They're not protecting you, they're protecting these boys, these boys. Which kind of goes to the heart of our story because right. Jesus said that he was the good shepherd. He was willing to lay his life down for his sheep. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus died on the cross for us. He was willing to do that. A hireling, somebody that you hire, you're not too sure of. Even though we always had bodyguards, we weren't quite sure if, if it came down to it, yeah. would they really protect us or would they turn and run? Would they turn and run? And we never, we never knew and we never had to find out. Yeah. It was actually, oh, and, and I, when I tell stories about Mexico, I always say this, is that it was a wonderful experience for us. We were there a little over three years. And we were always felt safe. We always felt safe. And we always had a wonderful time. And every country has its good and its bad points and stuff like that. But it was just a, it was a wonderful time for us. In fact, both of my kids ended up marrying Mexican nationals. Both of my, both my grand, both my son-in-law and my daughter-in-law are Mexican. Um, my, my son lives in Mexico now with his family. And my daughter lives here in celebration. And my daughter, my, my granddaughter, who you've all seen, little Anna, is a little Mexican American. She's half Mexican Aww. and half American. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of fun. She'll have she'll have two passports. She? She'll have two passports. So that's pretty good. So again, let's go back to the text. We said these these parables in um, in the Gospel of Luke are all related. You have. Uh, the 99 and 1, as it's sometimes called, which is what we're talking about today, which is the lost sheep. Then we have the lost coin, which we'll talk about next week, and the prodigal son. Uh, so it's lost sheep, lost coin, and lost son. So, so the question is this, is have you, ever, have you ever been lost? Have you ever been lost? Have you ever gone somewhere, maybe as a child, or maybe not as a child? Maybe you just went out and tried to explore and you, you got lost. You got lost. What was was it? Kind of scary. Sure. It was. It was. Yeah. It was frightening. Anybody have a story? All good stories have have good endings. You know, 
So you got at least the policeman brought you back and they found you. We have a we have a picture. You know, we live here in celebration because we're Disney fans. I mean, a lot of us are Disney fans, right? I was at the hospital yesterday talking with uh, one of our one of the residents from from next door, and uh, I was talking to her and I had my legs crossed like this, and she looked down. And she started laughing because I had my my Disney socks on. I had my Mickey Mouse <laughs> socks on, and she she thought that was the funniest thing. The chaplain's coming to see me, and and we're talking about Jesus, and I have Disney socks on. I have Mickey Mouse socks on. There you go. See, yeah. yeah. It's great. So, so we've always, we've always loved Disney. And when we lived in Michigan, we would come down here to Orlando at least once a year, and we'd come down with friends, and and we take pictures. And we still have this one picture of this of this family gathering, this family gathering, and there's a child that's missing, and it's the picture we took when we realized, okay, that one of the kids, okay, one of the kids was not in the picture. And we had left her in the store. We had left her in the store. We had gone through these stores. And that's the issue. And that's the problem when you've got like four or five adults watching five or six kids. You know, it's like we're all watching the kids, which means that at any given time, we're not watching anyone in particular. And, and sure enough, Holly wasn't in the picture. And it's like, oh, my goodness, where's, where's Holly? So, it did, so we went back to the store we were just in, and she was crying because she realized that there was nobody around. So you, you, you felt lost. You felt lost. But we still have that picture. Now, Holly is now about 34 years old, and she's got a little daughter herself. But she, she sees that picture. She was only four or five at the time. And she said, that's when you left me at Disney. <laughs> oh, man. Well, these, these stories about the, about the lost sheep, lost coin, and the, the, the prodigal son, um, tug on our hearts, they tug on our emotions, because all of us can understand what that is, understand what it's like to, to feel like you're, you're lost, that you're, you're, you're out of touch, you're, you're either lost physically, you know, this is before GPS, you don't know where you are, you're in the country somewhere, but you don't know where you are, or your parents aren't around, um, or you, maybe even as an adult, that You've lost your child. You turn around and all of a sudden your child is missing. And, and we hear all these crazy stories about kids getting kidnapped and things like that. And immediately we, we think the very, very worst. And that's exactly why Jesus teaches in parables. Remember, we said before that Jesus often spoke in parables. And Jesus says in, in Matthew 13, he says, he says, the reason I speak in parables be, is because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So that tells us a couple of things. It tells us that we're special. We're very special because God not only loves all of his creation, but God has reached down and touched you and allowed you to understand something that other people don't know. Other people don't know. In fact, Jesus was talking about all the Old Testament all the Old Testament prophets. And he said, don't you understand? They all looked. They all looked for this day that you now see. All those Old Testament prophets, they all look forward to the day that we get to embrace. We get to see something that other people don't. There's how many people in the, in the world? This is like 7 billion people, something like that now? Think about it. Think about it. And, there's, and we're fortunate that, that Christianity, by the way, regardless of what you hear on the news, Christianity is still the very largest religion, not only is it the largest religion, but it's also the fastest growing religion, regardless of what you see or are told on the news. You can't believe the news anyway. But, but what you're told is that it's in decline. That's not true. Now, here in the West, in the United States, we have a little bit of a problem because we're becoming more and more and more secular. You probably remember a time when on Sundays it seems like you would be driving out of your driveway going to church and all of your friends were down the, all the way down the street, right? Everyone was putting, getting in the car and putting their kids in the car and everyone was going to their local churches. And today that's not true, that, that we have fewer and fewer people that are finding their way to church. So we just have to pray for them and encourage them. But nevertheless... To some, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, which means God has telling you something, telling you something, giving you a hope and an encouragement that, that other people sometimes sometimes don't have, sometimes don't have at all. And I like that. I like that. It, it, I think that's why I spend so much time in the Bible, because I, there's always, always things I'm unpacking. I'm always finding things. Have you done that before? Have you read a story or you've read something in the Bible and all of a sudden you see something that you 
you've never seen before. You say, I've never, I've read this 20 times probably, and I've never seen that one piece of the passage. That's God unveiling the, the mysteries. The mysteries. So let's go, let's go to some of the particulars of this. Um, first of all, it's a, first of all, on the whole idea of the parables, remember parables are a mystery. Now a mystery doesn't mean that you don't know the answer. A mystery doesn't know me that he doesn't know. It means you have to kind of search for the answer. You know, if we, uh, you ever watch um, um, Murder, She Wrote? Remember Murder, She Wrote? Uh, we still watch the, the reruns of Murder, She Wrote, right? And you've, and you've got Jessica Fletcher, you know, who's supposed to be a, a writer of mystery novels and things like that. And she lives in a place called Cabot Cove. Now, Cabot Cove is the murder capital of the world, okay? You don't, they don't tell you that. But based on the four years that the series ran, there were 13 murders, and seven of them were relatives of, of Jessica Fletcher. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that. that's not good odds. I mean, this little teeny town, this little teeny town with all of those murders, and seven of them being part of the family, I think you ought to lock up Jessica, right? But the reason I bring it up is because in that movie, in, the, in those shows, you never knew who did it at the very beginning. Unlike some other mystery shows, sometimes you'll see the murder happening and then you're waiting for them to figure out who did it, but you already know. But in Murder, She Wrote, you were never quite sure. In fact, sometimes people were coming to Jessica Fletcher for help and actually they were the dirty ones. They were the ones that actually did it. Well, mysteries in the Bible are the same way. Just because it's a mystery doesn't mean you can't know the truth. It means that you have to kind of search for the truth. Sometimes it has to been, be revealed to you. It has to be revealed to you. I remember in my own life, I had grown up going to church. Like many of you, when I was a little kid, I was baptized and my family dragged me to church and I was there all the time on Sundays and I didn't know any different. You know, it was just, that's how we grew up. Yeah. And then as I got older and I could make my own decisions, it just wasn't that important to us. But then God got a hold of me. See, that's the, I'm the one, the 99 and one, I'm the same way. I was, I was the same way. I was, I was lost, and God found a way to be able to, to bring me back. He went searching for me and found me. You got you to bring that chair in a little closer. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Let's let Billy sit down here. You got it, Billy? All right, all right. Actually, that's a good question. Is can you stay lost? Can you stay lost? That's a great question. In fact, there's a there's a lot of debate on that. A lot of debate on that. And so rather than debating it, I'll tell you just what this the scripture says. The scripture says that God is able to keep you from falling. He's able to keep you in the palm of his hand. And there's another scripture that says that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor anything above the earth or under the earth, nothing can take us away from the love of God. Nothing can take us away from the love of God. So there are some other scriptures that talk about the dangers of falling away and be careful because otherwise you'll fall away. So I think, I think in answer to your question, the idea is this, is to, we want to live with confidence. We want to live with confidence that if we belong to Jesus, he's able to keep us. He's able to keep us. But at the same time, at the same time, we should live as if it depends on us. Okay? We should live as if it depends on us. It's the same way in your family. If you have brothers or sisters, if you have children of your own, you know that there's nothing that child can do that's going to stop you from loving them. But at the same time, from the child's perspective, that child should be honoring the father and the mother, and doing everything that they know that they're supposed to do that's honoring to them, okay? They shouldn't be lying and cheating and going to jail and killing murder and, and killing and doing all kinds of things, okay, to test whether their parents still love them. So they should do everything in their power to be able to honor their father and their mother. And at the same time, the mother and the father, we know, will never, they'll, they'll never stop loving that child. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. That's good. Well, yeah, there's some theological underpinnings. So, for example, there's, there's this theological underpinning. One of the things that comes up often is, well, what about suicide? What about suicide? We've had a couple unfortunate suicides here in Celebration, um, people that we know. 
uh, young people, tremendous future, t tremendously talented people with loving families. But for some reason, for whatever reason, they've lost all hope and they, and they, 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 they off themselves, they kill themselves. So the question comes up sometimes, well, what about that person? What about that person? Well, the teaching that somehow that they're forever lost, that that's kind of, that it's kind of gone, is not taught in the Bible. The Bible doesn't specify that suicide is anything different than any other type of sin. Okay, there's anything, any transgression against God, any time we do anything, whether we, we, we commit adultery or we steal something, or, you know, the Bible says that the greatest commandment is the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. The very best commandment is the first commandment, and we violate that often, right? Often, to not love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. So there's nothing in the Bible specifically about, about suicide. I, I believe the reason that came up is because there was a teaching, especially starting in the Middle Ages in the Catholic Church, that you had to have a priest to confess to, to be able to have your sins forgiven. You had to have a priest. So the idea was, well, there's no time. I mean, if you've, if you've killed yourself, there's, there's no time between that happens and the time to be able to speak to a priest. And that's probably where that teaching is coming from. But, you know, I, I really think that even, even a lot, some of my Catholic friends wouldn't agree completely with that teaching. And I'm not sure that teaching is still taught that way, taught that way. I know that, for example, people that have committed suicide are permitted to have a Catholic Mass. I know that for a fact. They so are they are. Not. They are. They're allowed to have a Catholic mass, and they're allowed to be and they're allowed to be buried in a Catholic cemetery. So some of those old prohibitions have gone away. So I'm not sure exactly what the teaching is, but probably that's where that teaching comes from on suicide. I don't agree with it. I think I'll go with this, what the scripture says that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and whether whether we, you know, whether we are worse at the end than we were during our life. In fact, one way, one way Pastor Pick, uh, described it to me is this. He said, you know, from God's perspective, there is no time. God is the, God is the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega, right? He's the beginning and the end. God is the God of the living and the dead, okay? So he says he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, they're dead a long time ago, but he says he's still the God of them. So God doesn't have this timeline. He doesn't have the, constriction, the restrictions that we do. So think of a shoelace. Think of a, I don't have a shoelace in my shoe, but look, think of a shoelace that you, that you, that you unravel off your shoe and, and have that represent your life. So on the left end of the shoelace is where you're born, and the right hand of the shoelace is your death, right? And you've got all kinds of things going in there. And somewhere along that line, you understand who Jesus is, and you've done good things, and you teach Sunday school classes, and you've done all kinds of great things, and your kids get a little bit older, and they get a little bit older, and then all of a sudden you're pretty much by yourself. And you're at, that, that's your life, right? That's your life. I mean, I, I simplify, but that's your life. Imagine God is going to pick you up. How does he pick you up? He just picks you up anywhere on, anywhere at all, right? He can pick up that shoelace in the middle. He can pick up it up at the end. It doesn't matter. To, to God, it's all the same. It's all the same. So whether it's an event at the end of your life or at the beginning of your life, to God, it's all the same. It's all the same. So you're always in that, in that relationship with God because God sees you in that relationship. So it's this way. Talk about the vertical versus the horizontal. Right? That's good. That's very good. Only one-on-one. -on -one. God knows everyone, but we don't know everything. No. No. Not at all. You know, and, and, and the thing is also is that, and that's, a, and that's the thing about suicide, since we're talking about this, is that that's a very visible thing. People see that. Right? It's obvious. Somebody kills themselves. We have a funeral. We pick them up. We take them to the undertaker. Right? We put them in the ground. They're done. Very visible. However, many of the things that we do that are offensive to God, they're unseen. They're behind closed doors. They're right there when no, they're when the lights turn off. Nobody sees what you're doing. Nobody sees. But God knows the intentions of your heart. God understands your heart. So if God knows everything about me, that that act that end that ends my life, that's not going <laughs> to be any different to God than than all of these other things that happen. Good question. 
Good question. Well, well, like I said, the question is a person that's lost. The question that's person person that's lost understands that where home is. Okay, if 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 I have no home, if I have no if I have no place to be, if I'm not going anywhere, I can't be lost, right? I can only be lost if I know where my home is. If I know where my home is, I know I'm lost. But if, if I'm just traveling through this world and I have no connections with God and I have no connections with anybody else and I don't know that heaven is my home, I don't know my parents, I don't know my family, I don't know that God loves me at all, I'm not really lost. I'm not lost. I'm just out there. I'm just outside, outside. There are, the Bible is, is clear that there are people that are, that are outside. There, there are people that are outside. There's, unfortunately, there's, there's punishment that usually waits for them. And the reason there's punishment that's waiting for them is because God's a just God. God's a just God. God, God gives us every opportunity to be able to understand who we are and the opportunity to be able to do the right type of thing. It's always, that's always possible. You know, the thing is, is that your relationship, going back to what Ramona said, your relationship with God is one-on-one. -on -one. It's between you. Absolutely. There's kill yourself. Yeah. It isn't vain when you're gone all this. Right. There's deathbed conversions. Plus there's a, a person God can touch a person's heart and a person can change without being public about it. I realize that in our churches today we want people to be able to raise their hand. We want them to go forward. We want them to take a Bible. You know, Pastor Ken wants to give you a Bible. He wants you to be reading the Bible. We want to we want to know that. We want to be able to know that. But there's many, many people that that could have a relationship and do have a relationship with God, then aren't very public about it. It's, it's deep within them. It's, it's one on one. So who are we to judge? Who are we to judge? We know that, for example, that through testimonies that there are many, many people in Iraq and Iran, people that are Muslim, that the stories are that Christ is actually appearing to them. He's actually showing up at their bedside. And explaining to them, just like he showed up with Paul on a, on, or Saul on, on the road, um, and, and saying, I am, I am Jesus. I am the one. I am the Messiah. I'm the one. And they're putting their trust in God, but they have to be quiet about it for a while because their family doesn't understand. And they're in a place where if you, if you convert to Christianity, you're a dead man. They will, they'll kill you. So there's a number of people that are, are converting, and we'll may see in the future that these people will come out and be public, but we know that it's happening. There's a lot of people that, that do that. People come to Christ all different kinds of ways. And again, that's what this, that's what this parable goes back, is that the, it's the shepherd that goes searching you. Notice in here, by the way, the sheep is not, is not looking for the shepherd. Okay, The sheep is just kind of wandering around. He's just kind of walking around, looking at rocks and stuff like that. He's, he's, he's not looking for the shepherd. The shepherd goes out and looks for the sheep. I always get a kick when people say, well, I was kind of lost until I found Jesus, <laughs> which is a nice story, but I, I kind of laugh yeah. because, no, you didn't find Jesus. Jesus found you. The one that was doing the work the whole time was, was God. When I look back at my life, I realize all those moments that it was God that was working in my life. It wasn't me as much searching for him, which is kind of funny because we have a whole movement today called seeker-friendly churches. These are churches for people that are seeking God, where the Bible says that no one seeks after God. The Bible says that. No one seeks after God. No one seeks after righteousness. All have fallen. All have, all have fallen astray. So the, the people that are, in answer to your question, the people that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, that have never heard, they'll be judged based on what they've done. They'll be based on what they've done. We aren't judged based on what we've done. We're based on whose we are. Because we belong to God, we're judged because of whose we are. It's, it's Jesus that pays the penalty for all my sins. I don't have to be, I don't, I'm judged on my own works. The people that are without Christ have to be judged on, and they have to either stand or fall based on how good they are. The problem is that the Bible says that all have sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there's not a lot of hope. We don't have any hope in the Bible outside of Jesus Christ. Now, could God do something? Absolutely. Is it beyond God's ability to reach down and save the lost that never know Jesus? Not at all. God has the ability to do that. He's never revealed that to us. He's never told us about that. So the only hope that we have is this. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like somebody, that, uh, somebody that's, uh, that's flying in an airplane. 
and uh, the airplane starts sputtering. And the pilot says, yep, I've seen this before. I know about this. This plane is certainly going to crash. And a man from the back of the plane says, no, wait, stop. I'm the person that designed this plane. And what you need to do is this, is you need to take this lever and move it to the forward position and take this lever and move it to the back position. And the pilot says, well, that makes no sense at all. The guy says, I'm telling you, that's the only way that you're going to make it. You have to take this lever and move it to the forward position and take this one to the back one. Now, could there be another way if the pilot decides not to do that? Is it possible that the pilot could find a way to be able to safely land the plane? The designer says, that's the only way. So you can gamble and decide not to go with what the designer of the airplane says and do your own thing. But the whole crisis started off because the pilot was sure that the plane was going to crash. And that's kind of the way I kind of look at that. Is that's, a, that's a parable. That's my own parable. That's Ken's parable. It's a parable about the plane because we're all on that. We all can understand that. We all understand that there's designers that understand exactly how something's supposed to work. Can we use the tool that has been designed by something and try to do something different with it? Can we make it work some other way? Anything's possible. Anything's possible. Right. But I'd rather go with what the designer says. I'd rather go with what the designer says. There you go. Yeah. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for this parable. Thank you for the opportunity to get together like this. The questions, they're wonderful. We thank you, Lord, for You've been listening to Faith Dialogue with Pastor Ken Baer, recorded live at Celebrate Seniors, a ministry of Faith Dialogue. You can listen to or watch all of the recordings at Faith Dialogue by going to www.faithdialogue.org.